Welcome to the Economic and Small Business Development Committee. Um, Madam Clerk, you will you please call the roll. Chairman Horn. Amen. Senator Vanderbilt. Present. Senator Lowers. Senator Schmidt. Here. Senator Lasada. Yeah. Senator McDonald. Here. Senator McMorrow. Yeah. Senator Geis. Senator Moss. Here. Mr. Chairman, you have seven members present. There is a quorum. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And before we get into the uh, the meat of the uh, session, uh, committee session, I'd like to recognize Senator Lasada for a very special introduction. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, um, I have a special guest today and a special uh, family here. Um, my special guest is Leah. Do you want to stand up, Leah? Leah was, so you know March is reading month. Leah was the winner of a contest I had for students um, to see who could read the most books. And Leah, was it 205? 207. Okay, she read 207 books in March and she won the contest. So Leah came today and she is now, um, was sworn in as a junior senator and Leah brings her family with her, her mom and dad and her little brother. So thanks for being here, Leah. Congratulations and, and welcome to our committee, to your whole family. Um, so with the motion from uh, Senator Vanderwald uh, to adopt the uh, committee, uh, committee minutes from the previous meeting uh, without objection, it is so moved. Uh, it, and I think, do we, we'll wait until uh, to make sure uh, all members are here before we uh, do any more housekeeping. With that, I want to start right into a presentation uh, with the uh, Home Builders Association, Don Crandall. Uh, you've been working very hard on a package of uh, bills for, uh, for housing, for uh, workforce housing, and I'd like you to introduce that uh, the idea of this as we as we're still in the process of kind of gathering all the bills together thank you we appreciate the opportunity to be here today i'm actually going to kick it off with josh lunger from the grand rapids chamber as the intro of the housing michigan coalition and then i'll go into some housing statistics before we then wrap back into and yes senator we will keep it brief <laughs> Well, thank you, Senator. As Dawn said, my name is Josh Lunger. I am the Senior Director of Government Affairs for the Grand Rapids Chamber. And on behalf of Dawn, myself, and our colleagues who are on Zoom, um, Jen from MML and Kent Wood representing Housing North, we're really thrilled to be uh, with you here today to start this conversation. Um, this is a topic we care a lot about, and I'm sure all of you have heard from your districts um, over the course of probably the last few years how important this discussion is. So you can see our executive committee here for the coalition. The coalition started um, potentially, I want to say like six, seven months ago, we were, we've were we all been working in our own kind of bubbles about this topic and realized that it's going to require all of us to make a dent in this issue. Um, and so we went, we came together and then we went out to groups. Um, many of these coalition members participated and asked them for their ideas. What, what can we do as a state? We've all been working locally, we've been working regionally. What can the state do to help um, improve housing outcomes? Um, because we know it's not unique to any one part of our state. Um, and they came back with probably 30, 40 ideas and we went through them and we found the ones we thought would have the most consensus from the various viewpoints um, we're moving forward. And now we've got about 90 some organizations that participate in our updates and um, engage with us. Uh, about 40 of them are publicly uh, members of the Housing Michigan Coalition um, and they've been great resources as we've been trying to develop this stuff. Um, real quick, just about us is again, it's, it's businesses, it's nonprofits, it's communities, it's Townships, cities, um, for-profit, non-profit developers, builders, it's, it's the, whole, uh, the whole group. So it's really a strength of our group is that we have these different perspectives. But I wanted to highlight that our focus is driving these consensus changes this year. The need is urgent. Um, we think the tools that we're going to talk about today and, and hopefully uh, again very soon in more depth are going to have uh, improve outcomes across the state. Um, and we want to get moving as soon as possible. So we're going to start with a, an update from Dawn on the building industry. Uh, we'll go into kind of what the impact on Michigan households has been and then talk about our efforts uh, before we wrap up with questions. Dawn. Thank you. 
Um, I think it's important to get kind of a history of, of housing before we go into the, the crucial need. And so I'm only going to highlight four numbers, five numbers on this chart. If you look at 2005, uh, there were 54,721 single family permits pulled in the state. And by 2007, that number had dropped to 15,000. And by 2009, we had dropped to just over 6,000. Historically, we should be building anywhere between 25 and 30,000 new homes a year just to keep on par with our aging housing stock. And for 2021, we've predicted just over 16,000 single family starts for the state of Michigan. And as of March year to date, we had pulled 4,100 single family permits. So I think that's important to set the tone of why this is so important. And also to look at the positive impact on the economy, and I'm not going to go through all these numbers, but if you look at the 54,000 numbers, we were a $9.9 .9 billion um, industry, we 3.3 billion in taxes to state and local, and those houses and those permits created over 153,000 jobs. So I always say we are a, a bunch of small builders, but we create and have a big impact on Michigan's economy as, as we build uh, the needed um, homes for individuals. So really there's three barriers to housing and we're gonna to touch on all of them, but I wanna really highlight the cost of materials right now. If you pick up any paper, you see that lumber has skyrocketed. Um, I know Senator Horn has been doing some projects on his home, so he's fully aware. Um, but in the last year, lumber has increased the cost of a new home by at least $16,000. OSB has gone from $9 a sheet to $50 a sheet. Uh, and Weyhauser may run out of the resin that's needed to create OSB board in our state. So we really do have a materials issue um, taking place and hitting new builds and even remodels pretty, um, pretty hard right now. Siding is also another issue where two of the largest suppliers in vinyl siding has just discontinued their most popular 15 shades. I don't know what we're gonna end up with, but 15 shades have been discontinued. And then just as a real life example, we had a conversation with one of our builders in Kalamazoo, and in 2019, the lumber to build a home that he was building was uh, $67,000. And that same lumber package today is $127,000. So you can see that lumber has drastically gone up. We have some charts in here, I'm not gonna go through them, but you can see the increase of softwood lumber prices from 2018 through 2021 and then the inputs to residential construction, um, goods, less food, and energy. You can see how those um, increases have impacted as well. Um, and then again, cost of lumber, you can see that, you know, it's just gone very through the roof, I like to say. Um, and as we look at also roofing and shingles, those have also increased. Um, that first increase went up in, I wanna say October of last year and we've seen reports that those will probably go up two more times this year as well. So barrier number two to housing is workforce and labor shortage, which has been an issue uh, for years. It's not a COVID thing, but uh, definitely has been increased during COVID with unemployment benefits. And our, we hear from our members, it's easier for individuals to stay home than to come back onto a job site. Um, so in 2019, there were 126, 880 individuals employed in the following trades that we track. And I'm just gonna highlight four of them. If you see the, the largest ones are carpenters, construction laborers, electricians, and plumbers and pipe fitters. So you can see that we have a wide range. This is by no means exhaustive of what goes into the building of a home. I literally stood in my home and looked around to see what was, was in it, and this is what I came up with. Um, not only do we employ a lot of individuals in the residential construction industry, they are also good paying careers. And I've just highlighted that the average median wage range, uh, starting with helpers is $13.51 an hour to construction manager uh, being $46.48. So what are we doing as the HBA to solve the workforce uh, shortage? You have bright orange bags in front of you. We created the Skilled to, Michigan, uh, Skilled to Build Michigan Foundation, and our three goals are to cultivate, educate, and recruit. Um, and how do we work to achieve these goals? For March is reading month, as Senator Lasada pointed out, last year we were on track to distribute 20,000 Billy the Builder Bear um, Builds a House books to grades K through three. 
Uh, we got about halfway through, and then you'll recall on March 13th, everything came to a, to a stop. You have a copy of that book actually in your bag. We partnered with the Michigan Association of School Counselors, who I know, Wayne Schmidt's all over it, um, to distribute. Uh, we have a great working relationship with the school counselors. Very, um, they're very engaged and very involved. October is Careers in Construction Month. We are working on an activity book to target four, five, and six graders. Uh, we work with construction trade CTE programs. We partner with the Michigan Construction Teachers Association. We participate in job fairs in my career quests for middle and high school. We have created also in your, in your bags, you will see a guidebook that I call for general population. But we also created one for veterans um, that we really focus on the military aspect of their training and then match that up with the trades that we track. Uh, we recently applied to the Michigan Department of Education, and it is my understanding that we will have an HBA recognized certificate for students that come out of construction trades. That's we're waiting for the final word, um, but we will be able to partner with them and give them a recognized certificate within our industry as they complete our um, requirements. And then we've also partnered with the Department of Military and Veterans Affairs, and as I mentioned, we created a guidebook specifically for the military. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Josh to talk a little bit more about the Housing Coalition. Yeah, we're gonna talk a little bit about the impact on Michigan households. So what's this mean? Um, Dawn covered a couple of the barriers that we're obviously encountering the workforce materials. Um, another one is zoning and land use, and I wasn't sure if we were just texting Jen, um, she wanted to make sure that we highlighted the, the local things that need to be worked on um, at each local level with the zoning and land use. Can she just jump right in? Does that work from the yeah, Zoom? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yeah, Jen. Uh, yep, jump right in. Okay, great. I just wanted to jump in and, you know, because when we were talking about barriers to housing and specifically how zoning is um, part of this this problem to either solve or sometimes be a barrier, um, that part of it is antiquated zoning and the cost to update um, zoning communities. You know, if you get a great master plan put in place, um, to be able to follow that up with an update to your master, um, to your zoning ordinances, to make sure that what you are planning for in the future, your regulations actually allow for and um, incentivize time-wise um, to permit what you're seeking to, to, to end up with. And uh, one of the things that uh, many communities that are pointed to as being great to work with development wise um, have been through the redevelopment ready communities program at the Michigan Economic Development Corporation. Um, the MEDC that program is a technical assistance program that communities who complete it um, receive technical assistance dollars that they're helped as a match to be able to update their zoning and so just wanted to, I guess, buffer <laughs> as my um, fellow executive committee members hear me talk all the time that yes, local zoning does need to be updated and yes, local zoning is part of the solution, um, but um, just preempting locals from being able to make those decisions is, is not the solution. <laughs> and I'll be happy to answer questions once we get through the presentation if you have any. So then in general, we're also aware this, there is a, a big component of this is a supply and demand issue as well. Um, and so I've got some more charts in here. Hopefully it can pop back up. I won't go through it all, but those are some sample projects from West Michigan uh, that shows kind of the, the baked in costs, a lot of it driven by what Dawn has shared and really how difficult it is to, to cut away at some of this so that we can make these households more attainable for more um, folks. And so you can see when we talk about land use and zoning, that's, that'll be the orange on this chart. That'll be the, the land use or the land that you have to purchase. So it, impacts, it can impact a sizable portion of the property, but it's only one component. And our goal has been, what can we do to, to bring costs down overall um, to really get at that workforce housing area? Because there's not a lot of tools currently in Michigan to do that. And we'll talk about that again in a minute. Um, the National Home Builders shared this um, chart that shows exactly how many households can afford to buy a home priced at which uh, price point. So you can see a, a big chunk, over two million households in Michigan can only afford to purchase a home below 250,000. And that's not something currently that's very uh, producible 
uh, here in, in Michigan. Um, and, and so we're trying to say how can we get more product like that into the market. Um, we do have some great uh, research. Last year we partnered with the City of Grand Rapids and some other partners including Housing Next um, and the Fry Foundation to do a, uh, a, a needs study for the entire county. And we need 25,000 units by 2025, um, almost 25,000. And what, we've, what we see is, uh, this is a, um, a demand chart right here for both the city and county, that's why it has different colors. But you can see between that 50% area median income and the 120% area median income, so kind of your average working family in a lot of ways, um, the demand is in the, in the tens of thousands. And um, that's a product, again, that's very hard. And those folks then, they're left to, their decision is, well, I'm gonna have to purchase a home somewhere or rent somewhere. So they're kind of going, stepping down, I'll say stepping down, and purchasing something in a, maybe it's not a desirable place, um, but that's impacting the people that are down the ladder from them in terms of um, what they can attain in housing. Uh, and although West Michigan has led the country in a lot of ways with a 6% income growth in the last few years, our price average sale of a home has increased by 70%. And we've seen 40% increase in, um, in rent. And, and then we found out just last week, uh, Kent and Ottawa combined have added 90,000 people in the latest census, but only 7,800 units. And the units meaning apartment, a single apartment is a unit or a single family home. Um, so we're actually falling further behind and you add that to the, the aging housing stock that Dawn was sharing earlier um, is why we're so concerned. This next chart is just some newer data um, to, that you can look at that has it, um, the income, the rent, or the price of a home that individuals in these area median incomes can, can afford to buy, um, just for your, if you want to take a look at it. It just kind of puts it in another context so you can see at what income can a household afford what type of house or what type of, of rent. Uh, Kent's going to share a little bit on northern Michigan um, to show some of the commonalities and some of the differences that we're aware of and then talk about what kind of jobs are being impacted. Did you unmute, Kent? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I've also got with me Yarrow Brown, who is the executive director of Housing North as well. And... Um, you know, as, as we look at the numbers um, for, for Northern Michigan, um, I think the, the important thing to point out is, as, as Josh mentioned, you know, the, the tens of thousands um, need in Kent and Ottawa counties. We also see that similar type of need in the thousands. And even if you look at kind of Northern Lower as a region, um, also tens of thousands, even just across that area too, which is um, by far not the most populous area of the state. And so if you, um, if you take the numbers that Dawn shared earlier in terms of the, you know, we're, we're predicting about 16,000 units to be built this year. When you look at Senator Schmidt's district, um, for example, um, Senator Schmidt's district is, is going to need, you know, nearly half of those this year. And so if these were, um, you know, if, if, if you all were, were uh, you know, giving these housing units out and Senator Schmidt came to you and said, uh, hey, I'm going to need nearly half of those for the 37th district. Um, you would all say, no way, okay? because I've got half or, or more than half uh, in my district that I need also. So when you look at it in, in, in those terms, um, hopefully you can kind of start the, to understand where that gap is. And I know as, as, um, as Yarrow um, speaks to employers from around the region too, um, you know, th they're hearing the need from, you know, everybody looking for frontline service industry um, to labor type of jobs, and then everything to management and even C-suite type of jobs. And some of our, our larger, uh, more global companies um, trying to bring in, you know, vice presidents and CEOs and, and things like that, they struggle as well um, because there's, there's just not enough out there on the market. So I'll stop there and throw it back to Josh and I, and of course, Yara will be here as well for, for questions at the end. Thanks, Kent. So we'll, we'll kind of sum up with what, what are we trying to do about it. Um, the, the most of the legislation and, and the ones that we expect to talk about at the next part of this process is a set of tools that local units can choose how, where, when, why, and for what project, um, and if they want to use it. Um, we, with, the, with the four of us on the executive committee and, and the many members of the coalition, um, one thing we want to prioritize is that, yes, the, there's a commonality to the need in every 
part of our state, but Kent County's need is a little bit different than Muskegon County's, is a little bit different than Northern Michigan's. And so how do we retain some flexibility and local control to, so that the tools we create aren't just gonna work for one region and not the other? Um, I think we're gonna be best off if this is a more applicable tool toolbox for everyone and then each municipality can decide again if and when and how they want to use it. Um, so we really prioritize local control. Uh, most of the bills are very common. Um, we're not going to go deeply into them today, but they are very have a lot of commonalities in that they allow um, an incentive up to, for those projects up to 120 percent of the area median income. But, but the locals can decide, well, if Grand Rapids wants to incentivize uh, uh, attainable housing for someone making 80 percent of the area median income, that's their focus, then they can negotiate with the, the builder, the rehabber, the for-profit, non-profit developer, whoever's doing the project, to try to reserve units um, based on the actual site conditions and the community's goals uh, for that type of, of part of the workforce. And so that, that's been a priority, is, is having that be flexible up to 120 percent. And then we, we really think that this is, this obviously could be used for, for lower um, the more lower income individuals and households, uh, but given the realities of the market and land costs and material costs, um, we feel that the best applicability or the best applications and the best uh, chance of for it being used will be for those workforce households, um, those folks that are making between 50 and 100 percent of area median income who just don't have a current product in the market that's desirable for them. Um, and so we think that we, we, would, we would believe that it would be mostly used um, for that type of uh, household. So here are the bills. We've got uh, some pretty great sponsors, including the, the chair, uh, Senator Schmidt, and Senators Moss, um, here t with us today. Uh, but we we're really, really thankful for the bipartisan leadership um, and, and engagement on this package. Uh, we think it's going to make, again, a better product that uh, is going to rally more support. And then in conclusion, you know, there's no easy solution. If, if this was uh, something that's going to solve housing, uh, we I think would have probably passed it years ago. But we think this can make things incrementally better in every community. Um, we know that this peak demand around the workforce housing is an issue and there's no tools to address it. So let's develop some tools to address it. Um, we, we're again super thankful for the broad bipartisan support, not just of our sponsors, but of our, our uh, coalition members. Um, and, and what's so great about this issue, why I like working on it so much, is housing is such a foundational piece and so many other systems are impacted by it. We know, and I, you can go back through the research, it's, it's going to be everything from job stability and access, uh, education outcomes, health outcomes, all of those things are impacted by whether or not you have stable, desirable housing. And if we can do 3% better next year because we've made progress on this, that's a success. And we really want to thank you for your time today. Happy to answer any questions. Um, and again, thank you to our sponsors on the committee for your leadership. Well, thank you, Josh, and, and, uh, and Don for the presentation. I, the, it, this is a, a very serious issue, and you brought up a couple, uh, workforce, uh, talent development. It, the, the housing issue is critical. And it's things that we've talked about over the past, and I think, Don, you were part of a conversation back in, would have been six years ago when we first, this committee first started taking a look at workforce yes. development. And I think we've made some progress in that arena, but it's just been all of us working together. And so this, the issue of housing, I think, is gonna need that same strong coalition. And it looks like you've put that together. Thank you. And I would like to say, I think the thing that is pretty amazing about this coalition, and I've been kicking around downtown for way too many years now, is you've ne I have never seen a coalition so diverse speaking with one voice. And so this really does show that it's not a home builder issue specifically. It truly is a workforce and talent issue. It's an employer issue on being able to bring workforce and talent into their companies. It, it's a municipal you know, local government issue, it really does impact all of us. And, you know, we really were thoughtful at who we reached out to and, and who we've brought in and, and very grateful for the groups that want to join us as well, um, because it's not just a home building issue. It, it, touches, it touches everything. Thank you. And I do have a question uh, coming from Senator Geis. There we go. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you for your presentation. I have a like three-part question. <laughs> They're all, it's all interrelated. Um, 
and having sat on my city's master plan steering committee a million years ago. Um, <clears throat> can, can you talk about the relationship between, so looking at the, the, the regarding siding and suppliers of vinyl siding discontinuing their 15 most popular colors, how much that has to do with, with tastes? So people not, let me finish, <laughs> people not wanting vinyl siding or if they are in a PUD, the HOA determining how much has to be vinyl versus brick versus stone, how much fenestration there needs to be and how that plays into steering, uh, master plans and um, place making and the making of desirable communities um, and, and as well as redevelopment ready communities. Um, I would say from what I heard on vinyl siding, it's not necessarily due to any of those circumstances, although I'll defer to, to Jen with the MML on, on how that impacts master plans. It's more of a material supply issue right now and a demand issue. Um, what we're seeing, uh, not only in the lumber issue or industry, but in terms of um, storms that took place down in the Texas region earlier in this year, it, it did um, shut down some of the manufacturing plants. So a lot of that is still building up from that closure. So it's more of a supply and demand versus any of those examples that, that you just demonstrated. I can, I will defer to Jen though to see in terms of how that impacts master plans because that is not my specialty. <laughs> so I would just add that in, in master planning, I think we are seeing a lot of more, a lot more communities um, through their zoning going to a, a form-based regulation um, instead of heavily regulating the use inside the structure. Um, but that is going to be more with your commercial type uses, um, business uses, um, not necessarily residential. Um, when it comes to homeowners associations, I mean, those are the people living within those homeowners association, uh, not the local unit of government if they start um, um, you know, picking and, and determining which kind of materials can be used. If, if I can follow up, so this, does that play into this at all, especially since as you have communities that are creating more PUDs versus say renovating a, an older home that's on a plot of land from prior um, community planning structures, is how, much, how much is that um, gauging this, this environment that we're in? I think it's definitely um, been part of the conversation, at least that local government and the home builders have been engaging in. Um, it is not in um, any of the, I would say it's not impacted by any of the bills that have been introduced thus far. Um, but I do see our communities, like I said, more and more moving to a regulation that's based on design standards um, versus the use the actual use of the structure. Um, and again, that's not so much for residential, but more so for um, business and commercial. Um, and I don't know if I'm answering your, your question, um, Senator, how you're asking it, but. Senator, I can jump in too. As Grand Rapids, I'll give them a shout out. Um, they just went through and approved a, a pretty major rezoning in January that um, opened up 50% more commercial space uh, for residential buy right on the first floor. And I've already been hearing from folks that are, in, you know, involved in the development community saying there's a whole bunch of projects over the next few years. We're going to be greenlit because before the, the economics of it just wouldn't work when it had to be retail only and we can't find, we, we're not doing retail all that great. Love retail, but we also need housing to support the retail, support the restaurants. Um, and it's in such demand. Um, and so we're tracking to see how the long-term impact of it is, but the early returns are fantastic and it passed um, overwhelmingly, which usually zoning items can be pretty uh, divisive in certain ways. Um, so we're seeing, uh, you know, other small, smaller cities around Grand Rapids take approaches at um, more form-based code, like Jen was saying, and looking at ways to increase density that can create uh, more affordable units, you know, based on the market conditions without having to be subsidized. And that's a huge part of what needs to happen across the state but it's not something that we can really control. We have ideas for, um, and, and Jen and I have talked, uh, for future legislation, potentially ways to in, um, help cover the costs or incentivize locals to look at ways to increase housing access um, through their zoning and, and land use, uh, but we haven't gotten far down that road yet. 
Thank and you. One I, point I to follow up on what Josh just said that I think is really important is um, not just the access to housing units, but actually what types of housing. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be your traditional single family uh, residential um, in talking about, you know, looking at commercial spaces um, and, and turning those um, into housing. Thank you. Uh, you've heard, uh, you heard the question and we make sure that we uh, get information back to the members mm -hmm. uh, as required. Uh, I have a question from uh, Senator Lowers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I apologize for not being here right when we started. So if this was covered, then I'll just catch up to it later. But um, I saw the list of, of uh, status of legislation. I guess I didn't know what did, was that covered, what, what the legislation would do or not do. Or No, that, that we haven't done yet, Senator. They, okay. you, have, you haven't missed anything. All right, great. Uh, Make we, sure. We just put in, we're kind of covering the, the need and the, uh, for the, uh, the bills as we go along. So there's just kind of a loose uh, testimony to, to line this up. Uh, so with that, thank you for your testimony. I see no further questions for you. And I'd like to, uh, moving along, I, I bring up uh, J.D. Collins, Executive Director from with uh, uh, the Michigan Small Business Development Center and Joshua Bellington, if you're here as well. Uh, in, in, in the audience, we also uh, from the from the center have uh, uh, Lori Long, Longdorf, uh, Hannah Burmeister, and Millie Chu. So if the two of you want to come up and let's not forget Daryl Horton as well from our events here. All right. Welcome, Mr. Borman. Well, and then for your testimony, your uh, if your mic is on, the floor is yours. Check. Josh, do you mind uh, plugging in? Yep. Well, I'm sad Leah is not still here. I wanted to welcome her and thank her as well for having us. Uh, but Chairman Horn and members of the committee, thank you for hearing the testimony of the Michigan Small Business Development Center. Uh, Senator Schmidt, we would like to uh, thank you and appreciate you facilitating us being at this meeting today. And to all members of the committee, uh, thank you for being advocates for small business. Uh, I'm J.D. Collins. I'm the Executive Director of the Michigan SBDC. And I'm Joshua Billington, the Managing Director of, the, our, per, I'm sorry, of our Pandemic Response. <laughs> so I was really eager to be here today, and you may ask why. Well, it's because Michigan SBDC is recognized as a top three SBDC nationally. And we've created a pandemic response that's now the national standard, and Michigan entrepreneurs and small businesses are benefiting from our targeted programming. Uh, since March of 2020, we've been the go-to resource to help small businesses navigate the uncharted waters of the pandemic. And throughout the journey, we have helped them pause, pivot, restart, relaunch, survive, and thrive. And in some cases, gracefully exit. However, our work is not over. We anticipate that small businesses will continue to need pandemic-related services that we're gonna talk about here at least through 2023, that's our best guess right now. So as I prepared for my testimony, I tried to put myself in your shoes and come up with topics that may interest you. And so I started with number one, who we help, how we help, and then let's talk about our pandemic response. So let's jump into it here. It's important for you to know that the Michigan SBDC was able to respond to the pandemic needs of small businesses because we received CARES Act funding. In some cases, that demand has been as high as 750% of our normal volume. Just let that sink in. We were receiving a month, in a month, we were receiving a year's worth of demand at the SBDC. Our website was getting so much traffic, we had to upgrade three times. Mm -hmm. We had to upgrade our service package three times just for the demand because people were coming to our website looking for help. So, it's important to also note that demand isn't slowing right now. That demand is remaining high, about two and a half times our normal volume. So as I present the testimony today, I'd like you to have this question in the back of your minds. 
How might the SBDC continue to service the pandemic needs of small business after CARES Act funding is exhausted? And stop me along the way. I'm happy to answer questions. Um, but let's go through some background here first. So who we serve? We serve all 83 counties in the state of Michigan, divided into 10 regions, hosted by universities and local economic development organizations. We're funded by the SBA, the MEDC, and our host institutions. And that typical funding supports about 100 consultants, along with entrepreneurial and small business programming and education. We help first-time entrepreneurs like Talisha Felton. You gotta show Talisha. With business planning, financial preparedness, and business planning fundamentals. Talisha's skincare business was also highlighted during an SBDC virtual marketplace event that featured Michigan small businesses of color and reached over 100,000 potential clients. We also serve second stage growth businesses like Innovative Solution Partners, helping owners like Mariah with growth and marketing strategies and helping her pivot from a dire COVID business environment to a viable business future. The SBDC's technology commercialization team consults with emerging technology companies like Asparovax. Let me show Asparovax. Now we help them with technology commercialization experts. We also help them um, with the process of developing a COVID-19 vaccine that could be an oral vaccine. So this is really exciting news. And I would like to pause for a brief second to say that we also manage two funds on behalf of the state. And when the pandemic hit, the leader of our funds decided that we should be investing and in looking at Michigan small businesses that could help fight the pandemic. This is an example of one of those. And Asparo, Asparovax is on the road to having a vaccine candidate that can be taken orally rather than through an injection. Now, the pandemic also found ourselves in territory that we have never seen before, helping small business owners like Nancy at Landmark Tap House and Grill with PPP, Idle, and MEDC grants. Uh, we also provided her with marketing resources, helping her get her menu online and pivoting her business to a new normal. In the hour long version of this presentation, I'd go on to talk about many more services that we provide for small businesses like export assistance, market research, working with our main streets and whatnot, um, and also helping businesses grow. You have in front of you a copy of Focus 4, and that's a Michigan made guide that prepares small businesses for growth. Now, I can talk a lot about what the SBDC does, but it's typically our clients that say it the best, and Sean Gartland has the favorite quote of mine. He says, you can Google a lot of things, but when you need to talk to an expert, that's where the SBDC comes in. I'll pause for a quick second to ask, see if there are any questions before I jump into how we help. We typically wait until the end, and then we'll, we'll bombard you. Sounds good, sounds good. So how we help. Um, at our core, we're one-on-one -on -one consulting services at no cost, unbiased, and confidential. We listen to small business needs, we tailor an approach, and we guide the business through the process. We do this via our collective expertise across an array of topics. We are subject matter experts, we are coaches, and we are mentors. So then the pandemic happened, and everything changed. When the pandemic hit small businesses, the Michigan SBDC was called to duty like never before. We responded accordingly. Initially, we gathered our partners, shared information with the small business community. The SBDC's actions quickly earned us the nickname, the source of truth. And that's why we had to upgrade our website so many times. We also quickly understood that the pandemic would be particularly hard for small businesses as noted by these four observations. Demand for SBDC services skyrocketed. Once again, we had more clients in a month than we typically see in a year. And in a typical year, we'll assist about 10,000 people. Last year, it was 85,000. Requests for services from minority-owned businesses also grew by 75%. The good news is we were there to help. The troubling news is the pandemic has hit women, minorities, veterans, and disabled businesses disproportionately. And then pandemic needs were different. Being able to help customers apply for PPP, IDLE, and MEDC grants has never been part of our portfolio. And the stressors of the pandemic also revealed potholes in our systems. It revealed potholes in our infrastructure. 
And if we hoped to meet the changing demands of our clients, we had to look inward and make investments that embraced efficiencies. So how did we respond? Well, if you were a person like me, you hire really smart people like Josh to come work for you. And Josh's help has been a result, resulted in a lot of what you're gonna see here. So I wanna give credit where credit is due and, and thank you, Josh, for, for your leadership in this space. So uh, without further ado, I'll jump into how we responded. Um, we met the demand by doubling our staff. Our ranks have grown from 100 to over 200 and many of our contracted consultants have full client loads as demand remains very high. We have generalists, we have specialists, we have outreach experts um, to handle this tsunami of demand. Now the Michigan SBDC's dedication to outreach, inclusion, and accessibility outdates the pandemic, whether it's tribal outreach in the Upper Peninsula, supporting returning citizens, or featuring businesses of color, our, <clears throat> our DEI approach has been met with humility, grace, and purpose. But today I'm happy to unveil Uplift Michigan. And that is the SBDC strategy to drive entrepreneurship, small business ownership, to the underserved population. Uplift combines the best of the national and local programs into Michigan's very own strategy. And with us is Millie Chu and Lori Lonsdorf, who are the authors of that strategy. So thank you guys for being here to support. If you have any questions about that, we'd be happy to answer those as well. Now the needs of small business also changed and we created a revitalization packages by contracting Michigan small businesses to help Michigan small businesses in focus areas that specialize in restaurants, childcare, retail, finance, mental health, as we've seen the stressors of the pandemic hit particularly hard in the small business community. And finally, we are investing in operational efficiencies. The SBDC had to fundamentally change the way we perform our work, expanding our one-on-one -on -one consulting, but also looking for ways to expand our capacity via anytime, anywhere resources and embracing a one-to-many model. We continue to make investments in the client experience, experience and asynchronous training and, and education. Again, Michigan's COVID response, Michigan's proactive use of funds, gives me comfort knowing that Michigan small businesses are being supported by an approach that is a national standard of excellence. But we have a problem. The Michigan small businesses continue to reach out to us in record numbers, and the pandemic response funding will run out before demand does. So I revisit the question I posed at the beginning of my testimony. How might we continue to service the pandemic needs of small businesses after CARES Act fund funding runs out? Thank you. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, seeing no questions, appreciate your testimony. It was good information and, and uh, something that we can use as we were to talk to our constituents back home. So glad to have you here. So I, with that, um, and seeing no absent member, uh, absent members, so we don't need a motion. And seeing no further business in front of this committee, this committee is adjourned. Thank you.